Coming up, three rocket launches in one day. More planets from Kepler. I talk with Marshall Culpepper about CubeOS and Cubos. And I take care of the whole rest of the show on this week's episode <laughs> of Tomorrow. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Welcome to Tomorrow. This is Orbit 10.23. I am one of your many, many hosts today. <laughs> I'm Carrie Ann. I've got Jared. I've got Mike. I've got Dada. Poor sleep deprived Dada. Uh, we've also got a bed in the background and a great guest for you. But before we get started in, into all of that, I want to make sure I give a huge shout out to all of our patrons. Uh, actually, these are our Escape Velocity patrons. Uh, these are the people who've given us $10 or more for this particular segment of this particular episode because they really, really believe in all of the crazy things that we do. And if you too would also like to contribute to all of the crazy things that happen here, feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash TMO. R O. It's been a week, and it's just gonna get <laughs> even better as we go along. Yes. Uh, so, Mike, as we so often like to make you dance at the front end of the show, uh, you got a lot of stuff to talk to us about. So, why don't we yeah. just go ahead and jump on into it? What's the first thing you got to talk to us about, Mike? See, so, so yeah, there was a lot of launches this week, most of which all happened yesterday. But uh, first off, we had a Chinese launch earlier in the week, although there was a problem with this launch, so there wasn't a whole lot of footage. But let's check out what little was provided. And that's it. That's it. And obviously, that was some amateur footage because uh, there was they were like, no that official was footage put out. That was a little <laughs> close. <laughs> Wouldn't be surprised if there was a guard nearby and was just like, "Hey, you can't, you can't be taking a cell phone video of that." <laughs> right. And wow. that was provided from a China Space Flight, a really good Twitter account that uh, provides a lot of really awesome information from China. But in any case, this launch was uh, supposed to be launching the ChinaSat 9A communications satellite. This launched on uh, Sunday, June 18th at 1610 Coordinated Universal Time from the Zhicheng Space Center. And the, with this satellite, it was supposed to reach geostationary Earth orbit, but it seems that there was a problem with the third stage of the satellite of the Long March 3B rocket uh, that did not perform as expected, and so it wasn't put into a, a, the correct geosynchronous transfer orbits. And it's supposed to be at 35,800 kilometers, and right now the ChinaSat 9A is currently at around 16,360 kilometers. So it's less than half the altitude that is needed to circulate its orbit to be geostationary. And the Long March 3B is the rocket that you see in the middle there that has four boosters uh, um, during the launch. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, the spacecraft is healthy, um, and they do have enough fuel on board to potentially get to the correct orbit, although the spacecraft was designed to last for about 15 years. So if they do use its onboard propellant to circularize and first get into the, the correct altitude that they need, then it's significantly going to cut short the lifespan of that satellite. So we'll see what they need to do. But one way or another, they have to move the satellite anyway. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's really, that sucks. Yes. <laughs> right? Because, because yeah, like you were saying, like you either have to get it to the, up into the right orbit and then, you know, instead of lasting 15 years, you could potentially only last 10 or 8 years. I mean, that could, you know, half its time span up there because it doesn't have the fuel to continue to stay in the correct orbit or you have to like deorbit and try again which is all kinds of like sadness and nobody wants to do that if we don't have to. Uh, and, and something that I didn't mention too is its high point, even though it's at 16,000 kilometers, mm -hmm. its low point is only 100 kilometers. So it's passing the orbits of lots of different satellites. Yeah. Even though it's in like a different inclination than the International Space Station, there's no risk of it hitting that. There's still traffic that they, you know, they have to move it. They either need to deorbit the satellite or push it out of the way so that it's not a problem. Wow. Man. Yeah, that's a. Yeah. Uh... That's rough. Glad I'm not yeah. making those decisions. Uh, yeah. China had some other good news later on that we'll talk about, though. But let's go ahead and move on to the next launches this week. Totally. So all on Friday, and for me, from my perspective, this next launch happened on Thursday night. But technically, it was <laughs> Friday coordinated universal time. So I'm talking about an Indian PSLV, Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle launch. So let's check out the, the, the footage from that. 
with this launch, it launched on Friday, June 23rd at 3.59 coordinated universal time from the Satish Dhawan Space Center on uh, India's southeast, Sriharakota Island. And 31 satellites were on board this launch, the primary one being Kartosat 2E, uh, which with it, it's joining the fleet of Earth imaging platforms to help observations of cities, crops, natural disasters, and other targets for the Indian civil and military authorities to have uh, cartography data. And India also had a small satellite with this launch as well called NewSat for agricultural monitoring de developed by uh, Indian University students as well as 29 other small satellites and CubeSats for other countries around the world and I really appreciate that the footage of this is getting just 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 better and better and we'll mm -hmm. see the payload deployment in a moment there's Cardosat 2E that you see on your screen that's the NewSat uh, developed by the Indian University students and then there was 10 satellites for the United States of America and then there were three satellites each for the United Kingdom, uh, for Italy, and then as well as for Belgium. And then there was one satellite apiece for Japan, for France, for Germany, Finland, Chile, Austria, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, Lithuania, and Latvia. So that was really cool that they were able to do that. Obviously, it wasn't quite as much as the 104 satellites. And here's the payload deployment as well. Um, so congratulations to uh, the, the Indian Space Research Organization and everyone else who's involved in this launch. And uh, I'm happy to see more and more uh, launches coming out of India. So, you know, very cool. After uh, last week's show, a lot of the comments, uh, and I, I think we have one in the comment section, but a lot of the comments were talking, uh, we, there was a very long conversation, I suppose, on our Reddit page. Uh, and if you're interested, feel free to, you know, reddit slash r slash tmro. Uh, but this one in particular got a lot of comments talking about the international, uh, well, international space station and international groups working together, international governments working together. Uh, you know how long ago that's that was, how long you know how we've done all those different things. Uh, and this is like this is like the freaking uh, Olympics of satellites here. This is like everybody, everybody, just about it seems like, <laughs> right? Yeah, like that's <laughs> that's so awesome. Uh, maybe, maybe Between they need this to and like, like the, the last Olympics. two launches, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really really cool. Uh, so there there's one more you know feather in somebody's cap talking about the internationalness of space in general. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really cool. Uh, and we've got more. So tell me more. What, what have you got, Mike? So this next one, there actually is no footage of this because this was a classified military launch, but I was particularly excited for this because this is the return to flight of the Soyuz 2-1V. Ah. And what makes the 2-1V special, you, even you would be able to identify that, differentiate that one from the other Soyuz, because it. it does not have the classic boosters on the side. It's just a, a single core stage. Sure. Um, but uh, there was a picture of the Soyuz on the pad uh, from this particular launch. This, again, was Friday, June 23rd at 1804 coordinate. Universal Time, and it launched from the Plesek Cosmodrome. And with this launch, um, it happened about an hour before SpaceX's launch, which we'll get to in just a moment. And this was the third flight of the Soyuz 2-1V. And the reason I said return to flight earlier is because back its first flight was conducted in December of 2013, and that's not to be con its second flight in December of 2015. The payload for that did not separate from the Volga upper stage, but after a long investigation, it was determined that the inner stage adapter between the payload and that Volga upper stage, or rather the decoupler, was faulty and didn't separate. So there was no problem with the rocket itself, and so this was able to um, clear its launch and, and go through. And uh, there's a footage, if you want to watch, of uh, one of those uh, previous launches of the, the Soyuz 1. But in that one, in that picture, you can definitely tell. You can definitely tell with this how it's different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it does look funny, though. It's so skinny. So yeah, that was footage of the of the mission back in 2015. But even so, the the, the Russian Ministry of Defense declared this mission a uh, success, even though we don't know what the payload is. So uh, that was pretty cool. But let's go ahead and move right along to the SpaceX launch. This is the one I'm most excited about. Let's just go ahead and start rolling the footage. Absolutely.
So yeah, SpaceX successfully launched this Falcon 9, which is a reused rocket, or rather a flight-proven Falcon 9 rocket, carrying Bulgaria's first communication satellite. And this was on Friday, June 23rd at 1910 Coordinating Universal Time and launched from Launch Complex 39A at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Now, after separating from the second stage, the first stage was able to successfully return to Earth and made a successful landing on the Atlantic-based drone ship, of course, I Still Love You. Although uh, the video feed of that was lost. We did get to see that landing. You'll see that in just a second, right here where we lost the feet. Now, with this, the first stage rocket, it's uh, designated Core 1029, originally launched the Iridium Next satellites, number one, numbers 1 through 10, back in January of this year. And boom, there we see that it was a successful landing. Even though it's slightly tilted, it looks okay. <laughs> and uh, it, when it first launched, it actually launched uh, um, back in January of this year from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California and landed on the Pacific-based drone ship Just Read the Instructions only six months ago. This this makes Core 1029 the first Falcon 9 stage to launch from both the west and east coast and land on both of the drone ships. So that's that's historic. Here's another first. And of course, they had a successful mission and were successfully able to deliver the Bulgaria sat into a good geosynchronous transfer orbit. So congratulations to SpaceX and everyone involved with this launch and making this a success. That's really cool. I guess I didn't so cool. realize that that was that that had you know flown originally from. Like you were saying, from California and landed there, and then like that's really cool. I, yeah, two coasts. <laughs> yeah, that should two that should also get a nice monument. Ships. If I you know do say so. Myself. Yeah, it makes me wonder if they're going to keep reusing this one or if it's going to be another one of the museum pieces. I right? guess uh, I guess we'll see. Yeah, huh? We'll that's, take it. That's yeah. Griffith. If oh, nobody wants it. We'll take it. Right. So. <laughs> we'll just put it out front. <laughs> In the parking lot. I mean, it's not like we have parking. <laughs> I'm sure there's there. a list. I'm sure there's a list. <laughs> right? Oh, that's a list. Anyway, yeah, that's it for lunches this week. All right. All right. Good. So, uh, Jared, you can compete with that, right? Yeah, I've got something nice. <laughs> nice. All right. So, lay it on me. What's going on? So, one of NASA's oldest space uh, programs within the space program, yeah. within the program of space itself, <laughs> yeah. uh, has deployed a new telescope, and it's using the International Space Station as an actual platform for it. Uh, now, cool. this telescope is... is called NICER, which stands for Neutron Star Interior Composition Explorer. So I will be calling it NICER from here on out. Uh, <laughs> it's a part of NASA's Explorers program, which actually was originally started by the U.S. Army in early 1958, but then was transferred to NASA in late 1958. So this is the longest running science program in NASA's portfolio of science programs that That's they run. Cool. So. NICER is going to pre perform what we call spectroscopy. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That right. well, spectroscopy, which is when you take in light and you break it into multiple wavelengths and analyze it from that. Now, it's not going to be using the light that your and I eyes can see. It's actually going to be using X-ray light, and specifically, it's going to be looking for X-ray light coming from neutron stars. And very interestingly, this is the first space science mission that is completely dedicated to observing and studying neutron stars as well. Now, neutron stars are the some of the densest objects in the universe. They form when a star five to 20 times the mass of our own sun ends its life in a stellar explosion that we call supernovae. Uh, now, NICER is an array of 56 X-ray photon detectors, and it's on a gimbal platform attached to the exterior of the International Space Station so that it can point at any point in the sky. And it's gonna take about 15 million seconds worth of exposures over its 18 month mission. Now it's currently in its commission phase. Uh, the other day they were actually testing out the gimbal system on board the International Space Station. Here's awesome footage of that, which is very sped up. It doesn't actually move that fast. Uh, mm -hmm. But <laughs> it's expected to take its first data or its, its scientific first light data uh, on July 13th. Now, it was delivered in the unpressurized portion of the uh, CRS-11 Dragon, known as the Trunk, and it was installed on the outside of the International Space Station on June 13th. And one very neat addition to this, besides studying neutron stars, is it has a scientific payload on board uh, that actually is going to test to see if you can use pulsars, which are uh, neutron stars that are spinning very, very fast. It's going to see if you can use them as sort of a deep space navigation system, sort of like GPS, but using pulsars and the timing from their spins to see if you can actually use that to navigate in space. So oh. that's going to be really, really cool. 
That is cool. Uh, Prismara, Prismara from the chat room says, won't vibrations from people inside the station interfere with observations? Um, it shouldn't, from what I understand. Uh, it's set up on a gimbal, a gimbal system, which actually is designed to take those vibrations okay. that come from the International Space Station. Cool. Mm-hmm. That's really very interesting. Yeah, all those astronauts doing <laughs> somersaults could really throw, you know, everything yeah. into. Yeah. Also, it. neutron stars are really bright in X-ray, yeah. so you don't have to take very long exposures to get light from oh, them as so well. So, like, super so, easy to see. Yeah, that. it's usually a couple seconds worth of exposure. That's all you need to actually uh, capture X-ray light from a neutron star. So. Oh. Awesome. Yeah. Like trying to take a picture of a toddler. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So, Mike, you've got you got some some anti launch uh, uh, stories here. Some undocking and redocking. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there was some good news from China. You know, I felt like I needed to talk about this since they had the uh, partial launch failure. Totally. Um, their first cargo ship, Tianzhou One, has successfully undocked, did a fly around of the Tiangong Two, and redocked. And uh, there is some footage of that. So cool. with this, um, their first vehicle, Tianzhou One, uh, it launched back in April on April twentieth, and it's now completed the sixty days at the station, and it's completed two refueling tests at Tiangong Two. The whole purpose for this test to make sure that they can actually resupply a space station. And after uh, that, uh, they redocked to it, they undocked again for the third time, and Tianzhou, will, Tianzhou 1 will begin a three-month free flight period in a different orbit than Tiangong 2, and will do some automated science experiments. And then before it conducts its final rendezvous and docking with Tiangong 2, which they're going to try to test uh, the fast rendezvous maneuvers that have kind of been tested out the International Space Station, before ending its mission by burning up in the atmosphere. And this is all paving the way for uh, China's next big space station module, which will be launched at the, uh, hopefully, the beginning of 2019, kicking off their Mir-class space station, and probably the next international space stations so yeah. very cool that is really cool mm -hmm. yeah i was going to ask uh why but then you already answered so thank you i appreciate that <laughs> <laughs> I'm like why would they do such a thing that seems like craziness and they're like oh just a practice I'm like oh i get it cool all right awesome yeah. <laughs> thank you go china uh jared mm -hmm. some kepler information yeah of course kepler the kepler space telescope which is in space, uh, as its name would imply, is looking at light coming from stars mm -hmm. and other exoplanets, uh, or to see the uh, exoplanets moving in front of those stars. Now, they just uh, released uh, the latest data set from Kepler, and it has 219 confirmed planets in its hull. So wow. uh, that now brings uh, Kepler's total number of planets that it has confirmed to 2,335. Mm -hmm. And it's provided about 4,000 candidates, which are basically light curves that we look at and we say, well, we're not sure it's a planet just yet. We still need a little additional data. Now, 10 of those new planets discovered are similar in mass to Earth, and they're orbiting within the habitable so zones of their stars, which several of these habitable zone Earth-sized exoplanets are actually orbiting stars like our sun. So we've been finding a lot of habitable planets around dwarf stars, mm -hmm. which dwarf stars are a little more temperamental um, in terms of radiation output and solar flares and other things like that. So maybe not the best place to have an actual habitable planet because mm -hmm. we're getting zapped all the time by that dwarf star. But a star like our sun is relatively stable. So now we're starting to find exoplanets around stars very similar to our sun. So. One thing that did happen with Kepler back in 2012 was that multiple reaction wheels failed. So they've been using uh, a new way of actually working with Kepler to stabilize it. Uh, it. The engineers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory realized that with the solar panels on Kepler, they're, asymmet they're uh, symmetrical. So you can actually point that towards the sun and use the photon pressure from light itself cool. uh, to stabilize Kepler. And that's what they've been doing since about 2013. 13 and uh, they're just let instead of Kepler looking at one spot in the sky like it did for three years it's now drifting across the sky and taking measurements as it looks over oh. a larger larger area of the sky um, now that means that we can't really find exoplanets that uh, have uh, very long orbits mm -hmm. uh, because Kepler can only look at one, one spot in the sky as it moves for about 88 days. But we can always revisit uh, the next year that area in the sky as well. And then here's a nice little chart of the total planet candidates in terms
terms of size wow. and orbital period, so how long it takes to go around that star once. The blue is what it's already found. The yellow is a part of the latest data release. And what's so cool, you can if you look at the this chart as the data is released, it goes from really big, like super Jupiters, and it starts to get better and better as we get better with our data down towards uh, Earth-sized planets over hmm. the years. So very, very cool that we are uh, still getting great data from Kepler. So I feel like this is not the first story this year that we've had about uh, exoplanets and mm -hmm. possibly habitable. I think we need like a count. A I'm count? A, like yeah. a total count? Like, bing! Yeah, wanna, you know what I'm saying? I want to say that the total... A counter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. I would, yeah. But you know what I mean? Like, just be like, well, this is 219 of them. Like, all right, cool. Add 200. Bing! Now our total, like, so far, just for 2017 is, you know, however yeah, many. That'd be pretty cool. I we think can figure so. it out. I know we have yeah. a counter at Griffith that says how many total confirmed exoplanets there are, and it's somewhere around, like, 3,428, somewhere in there. Wow. So it's, it's a lot. So that's, that's also news to me that uh, I knew about the reaction wheel problem, but I didn't know that it was looking at other parts of the sky now. Originally, it was just looking at the constellation of Cygnus. So yes. that's really exciting to me that it's starting to look at other places because it was like, cool, we're finding all these planets in one part of the sky, most of which are pretty far away from us. Yeah. Um, but now th that, that excites me to look, just, just look a little around a little bit more. That's cool. <laughs> I like it. That's really cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you know, next year we're going to have TESS, the tra Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, which is going to be doing what Kepler does, but for the entire sky. Oh, wow. So we're, that's going to be really exciting. They won't be looking as deep as Kepler did. Yeah, Kepler looked great. about uh, 3,000 light years or so deep. Um, but it will look at a larger number of stars to catalog them and see if there's any exoplanets there. So That is really wow. fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, so... That's that's really good news, mm -hmm. and and we like that. Yeah, we love good and news. Then, Mike, you had you had such a good story <laughs> earlier. What what happened? <laughs> Things happen sometimes, <laughs> man, and we need to talk about it because it's serious. All right, fine. Um, I'm talking about a 14 year old satellite that uh, has lost control. This is a Luxembourg's SES, uh, uh, the satellite operator SES. One of their old satellites, AMC-9, has stopped functioning and pretty much seems like they've had a complete service blackout with it. And this satellite is in geostationary orbit. This is a photo of the AMC-9 satellite before it launched uh, back in June of 2003, uh, which is kind of kind of interesting that it happened uh, in June, this accident happened in June, whatever anomaly this is. It launched on a proton rocket and it's supposed to be in a stable circular geostationary orbit of about 35,775 kilometers by 35,798 kilometers and inclined 0 0.017 degrees to the inclator. And that was their telemetry data as of last Saturday. But according to the Joint Satellite Operations Center uh, from a new tracking data set on Monday, it shows that the satellite is now at 35,615 kilometers by 35,984 kilometers. That's a big difference. And it's also inclined slightly 0 0.028 degrees compared to 0 0.017 degrees as it was before. And so this is causing it to drift. Uh, and they don't know what caused this yet. Uh, they don't know if it was uh, what, why it had this orbital change, whether or not it was a thruster misfire, some sort of leak from a pressurized fuel tank or a gas tank, uh, some sort of breach of a fuel pipe, or even an energetic event. Uh, in other words, an explosion of a battery or some mm -hmm. other electronic component, which they've been having on some old satellites lately, batteries exploding. Or it could even be something else, like a piece of debris or a meteor impact or something. They don't know what's caused it yet, but one way or another, uh, they are tracking it and it doesn't seem like there's anything else causing any additional thrust. They are in contact with the neighbors nearby that have uh, operating satellites nearby, and at this point it's unknown if they can recover it, move it into a graveyard orbit, or even communicate with it at all. So. We're just going to have to see how things go. But as of right now, there's so much distance between the satellites that are nearby it that there's no risk of any collisions or anything like that. And I haven't seen any data yet from any of like the orbital tracking stuff that there are any additional pieces around this satellite, which usually implies that there's like uh, pieces of debris or something like that if there's suddenly a bunch of smaller pieces around a satellite that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But yeah, this is a um, kind of weird situation, but uh, we'll see what happens and how uh, SES is able to recover from this. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, best of luck to them. Goodness, that's uh, zombie sats are always kind of a scary thing, just in general. There's so much stuff going on <laughs> in, like, right around that area that it's uh, scary when you lose control of something like that. Uh, mm -hmm. 
All right. And if they can't gain control of it right now, like it's eventually going to drift closer to their neighbors eventually. And so other satellites kind of in that area are going to have to use their thrusters to like move out of the way and stuff like that and then go back into where they're supposed to be for their normal service. Right. So, yeah. Otherwise, it's, it's going to be a problem eventually if they can't. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's going to cascade. Yeah. I think if it's, a, if it's a meteoroid impact, this actually wouldn't be the first thing in uh, GEO that's been hit by a meteoroid, if I remember correctly. So oh. uh, I think one of the GOES satellites actually took a, me a meteoroid impact uh, about five years ago, somewhere in there. So Interesting. Mm -hmm. oh, good to know. All right. Uh, Stuff happens. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Welcome well, to space. space. I know. Space is yeah. hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jared, I think... Uh, yeah, uh, we, we, this is Isa and Lisa, and I'm I'm Isa and Lisa and uh -huh. gravity waves. All right. So because I just I, <laughs> I you know California surfing waves and everything, it's just kind of how it works out. So Fair. we have to talk about uh, when we're getting in the waves, <laughs> and we also like to talk about the European Space Agency because they do such Why great not? work, uh, and they have selected their third large class mission, which is going to be a trio of satellites called the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, right? Which I will now call Lisa. Um, I so, will too. Wait a minute. Didn't they already have a, a spacecraft called Lisa? Uh, they have one called Lisa Pathfinder, which was to check uh. the to make sure that the technology for these satellites would actually work. And because okay, so been, they are related. Because, they are related, okay. and because it's been working so well, they went ahead and said yes, we're going to approve a full Lisa mission with three satellites instead of just one. Uh, so. Like I said, it's going to be three satellites that are going to be placed in an orbit around the sun. And these satellites are going to carry laser systems on board uh, that have been tested on the LISA Pathfinder mission. And they basically measure the distance between the spacecraft and they'll be able to see distortion, dist distortions in space-time about several millionths of a millionth of a meter. Uh -huh. So that's... Very small. <laughs> We're talking that part. I understood widths, widths of atoms, widths of of protons in atoms. Small. Um, wow. Now, by measuring this distance, this is going to allow extremely precise measurement of gravitational waves from not just black holes, but tons and tons of sources, including the early early expansion of the universe of what we call inflation. Now, Lisa will also potentially be sensitive enough to detect the current expansion of the universe as well and get that rate set. Now the spacecraft are going to do this roughly separated by about 2.5 million kilometers of distance. And like I said, they're going to fly in as a trio in a triangle, shooting the lasers at each other. And this is a little bit away, but it's always nice to see the things happening because mm -hmm. the launch has been preliminarily set for 2034 oh. so it's a little bit out there uh -huh. uh, like 17 years out there but right. it's very cool to see a mission beginning that is going to do some very fundamental physics work and uh, I'm very excited to get those results in like 20 years so it'll be really cool. <laughs> are we going to get results in 20 years or are we just going to get a launch in like not quite 20 years. See oh, what I'm saying? Uh, I'm pretty, I, knowing the European Space Agency and just how serious they are about this mission, especially mm -hmm. the fact that they launched Lisa Pathfinder, um, that tells that tells us that they're dead serious about doing this mission. Okay. So, yeah. I just know that sometimes you do stuff and then you do the thing and then you don't get results for 18 years or yeah. something. Yeah. Oh, and no. Then even this... if you get results, you start, you know, you end up going uh, back over all of the results just to mm -hmm. try and decipher, uh, like, all of the information and that could just take a while. Yeah. Well, when they re, uh, revamped uh, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO, mm -hmm. um, it only took them nine months to get their first result back from that. Nice. So, uh, so this should happen a lot quicker because the system will actually be a lot more sensitive and because it's in space, it will be even more sensitive since we can do very long distances with it. So, really so we cool. should see a, almost, I, you know, you can quote me on this in 17 years. Almost instantly, uh, it should start bringing back results on gravitational waves. All right. Right mm -hmm. on. Very cool. All right. I think that was plenty. <laughs> I feel like every new segment we go through, it's it's just like there's so much information. Uh, we quite <laughs> literally take up half of the show. So <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Ben will be conducting a great interview with Marshall Culpepper, who's a CEO and co-founder of CubeOS, or Cubos, sorry, with their Cube. OS. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> I'm actually getting the thumbs up. Thank you, Marshall. <laughs> so stay with us. We'll be right back.
And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview, I wanted to give a huge thank you to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who've contributed $10 or more. These are our Escape Velocity patrons. And we've also got our Orbital patrons. These are people who've contributed $5 or more to this episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash tm. RO. All right, I am joined by Marshall Culpepper, the CEO and co-founder of uh, Cubos, uh, which is the company, and the product is CubeOS, uh, which is a, uh, it actually will make sense in a moment, I promise. Uh, so Marshall, <laughs> thank you thank you very much for joining us today and taking time out of your Saturday. Uh, Benjamin, it was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, so before we get into uh, what uh, CubeOS is, um, why create a software space company? Oh, what a great question. Um, so I'm a software engineer uh, by training. I've been doing it for uh, about 20 years professionally. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had an amazing opportunity to join a startup um, that at the time was called Nano Satisfy, who were trying to put a few CubeSats in orbit that had these little things called Arduinos on them. Mm. Uh, if you're not a software engineer or hacker, basically an Arduino is a really simple to use hardware hacking platform that anybody can purchase at like a Radio Shack. And the idea was basically to get hackers and students into um, into space by letting them put their own software on an actual spacecraft. Uh, and so the the idea was put on Kickstarter. They raised you know several hundred thousand dollars on Kickstarter to put a CubeSat up where anyone could literally pay fifty dollars and put their own software on an, a satellite. So they, this was the concept. They hadn't actually done anything uh, with the concept yet, and uh, they didn't realize how much software help they needed. I convinced them to hire me, and within a little bit less than a year. Uh, the, the team that was there and the team that I had built had put three CubeSats that were launched from the International Space Station in short order. And uh, they were called the RGSAT missions. You may have uh, remembered them from like about 2012, 2013 uh, era. And so uh, those missions uh, really changed a lot of things for me because as a software engineer, I had never really considered the, the possibility that software could have an impact in the space industry. But what I realized in that moment uh, was that CubeSats had uh, fundamentally changed the cost equation. And as sort of a startup junkie and software guy, I realized that uh, with with the help of um, everything that's happened in the software sector and sort of all the disruption that's happened there, uh, there is like a real need for a a real a real serious company that takes software seriously within the aerospace industry, uh, not just with regards to a specific operating system or a specific kind of technology, but sort of an end to end company that looks at software holistically for an entire mission. So um, as you guys probably know that like all spacecraft run software, there's software on board, there's software on the mission operations, there's even software involved in the early uh, mission planning and mission testing. And so uh, what, what really surprised me when I first started in this entire um, endeavor was that there wasn't a company that did all of that. There was the companies that did little segments of it. Um, and yet in every other technology segment we see, we have software companies that do the software for an entire uh, entire suite of technology. So the the quintessential example is being Microsoft or Google, where you've got software that goes from everything to your cell phone to the cloud, uh, or cell phone that goes from your desktop computer uh, to to your phone, uh, things along those lines. Well, we don't have like, the equivalent of that in the satellite industry for some reason. And so that's why I started Cubus was basically to be the first software company that's wholly and fully focused on just software within the space industry. Uh, you talked a little bit about how um, you know every, every spacecraft, every satellite, uh, everything has software on it. Can you talk to you a little yep. bit of the importance of that software? Because you know we, we're all hard, we're at a minimum hardware geeks, right? We love seeing these <laughs> giant rockets launch and these satellites going into space. So there's there's something tangible, something you can see with the hardware. But the software is one of those things working behind the scenes that you never really think about. So what's the importance there? Uh, yeah, the importance is uh, hugely, hugely important. So um, just going back to what you said earlier, we're all hardware geeks. I mean, who here doesn't love to see a beautiful launch video and a, a rocket stage land on you know the, the barge in the middle of the ocean? Those things are amazing. But every single one of those things is, at the end of the day, uh, driven by logic that's written in software. And so while you're right that the beautiful sort of hardware and, and electronics there are just as important and play a major role in whether those things actually work, the software that controls the logic of how those things work is just as crucial and just as important and just as much money and importance is spent on those things as, as the hardware itself. Um, even going back to the early stages of the space industry, if you look at um, early days of NASA, you'll find that some of the most important engineers in the space race, the early space race in the 60s, 
where people like Margaret Hamilton, who literally invented the word software engineering, literally invented the soft, the, the onboard flight software for the early uh, Apollo missions, people that were for, for, uh, first and foremost in forefront of, of the space race. So software plays a critical role, not just in, um, not just in on spacecraft uh, uh, operations, but it also plays a huge role in the ground segment of, of any spacecraft. You've got a team that's op constantly operating and checking and doing software updates, doing commanding and controlling of their missions. All of that software is just as critical and just as important to the health and overall uh, overall success of any mission. So again, while while we don't see software in the forefront in any, in any satellite or any specific um, spacecraft mission, it is actually crucial. Uh, and so again, I, I see an opportunity here to tell that story, and that's that's why that's why I'm here. So, uh, you mentioned a little bit, uh, you know, you're trying to create an entire software stack. Uh, is mm -hmm. this for primarily for CubeSats, or is this for something above and beyond just CubeSats? Uh, so, yeah, just getting started. Yeah, CubeSats is where we are today. That's uh, we as that's where I started uh, my my entry into the aerospace industry. So everything we do right now has been mostly focused on small site customers that are doing CubeSats. Uh, and uh, microsats, but uh, our long-term vision is to get into the larger satellites and larger spacecraft. And so, um, as we are kind of a relatively early-stage startup company, uh, we are kind of we're kind of uh, earning our bones, if you will, in the in the CubeSat industry and the smaller satellites, and intend to go uh, further up into more mission-critical and more sort of uh, government and other uh, uh, types of satellite missions. So you touched on this a little bit, but I'd like to go into a little bit more detail. I'd like to compare and yeah. contrast. Um, if I buy, if I, if I create a CubeSat today, right? I, I kind of buy one. You can sort of off the shelf them for the most part, right? Uh, yep. What is the process I need to go through today, not using CubeOS, uh, to get my software on board? Versus, um, what is the process if I were to use CubeOS to get my software on board and do all of that testing? Uh, that's Perfect. a great question. So, to, so today, uh, one of the biggest issues in the CubeSat space uh, s specifically is that while the times to launch have uh, shortened, the amount of time you need that you have for writing software is like actually really, really compact. What happens is because most CubeSat manufacturers aren't really a large scale, it means that you have like a really large lead time on buying and actually getting any hardware that you buy off the shelf. So there's a number of different manufacturers you can just go buy your satellite hardware from uh, that will ship you a engineering or a flight model of the satellite. And when you get it, uh, it'll take, you know, maybe three, four, five plus months before it's actually in, in, in house. Meanwhile, you've already booked a launch. So you're at a hard deadline for here's where my launch is and here's when I've made my purchase of my hardware. So you've got to account for enough time between when the hardware comes in and then to develop the software. And then the software is good and it's, it's stable and you've tested it thoroughly and now it's ready for launch. And what typically happens, what we've seen in a lot of, especially CubeSat startups, is that they don't a lot more, enough time for software for the exact reason you mentioned earlier, which is they don't realize how important the software is. And then uh, what happens is they go over their time allotment on software uh, and then they they jeopardize their launch and they have to push it back. And it's actually really typical if you guys have been paying attention in the CubeSat startup space, especially for launches to slip just because the software is not ready yet, uh, or for even the, w the worst case scenario, which is the CubeSat gets to space and the software is not ready at all and the the thing is DOA. And so um, what we what we do and what we're where we sort of improve upon that situation is a few different ways. Number one, we offer support for Cubes, um, the majority of CubeSat off-the-shelf hardware already in our platform. So what that means is, and we also have emulation. So what that means is you can get started writing your software right off the bat using our platform. You can download it today. You don't have to wait for the hardware to arrive. So that means you, we de-risk the software coming after the hardware in your purchase process. The other thing that we do is we have a service called Hopper. And uh, basically, we have all the uh, CubeSat off-the-shelf hardware available in a cloud interface where you can literally just take your code, send it to our server, and it'll test it on all the off-the-shelf hardware that we have in-house here in our, in our office. And what that lets you do is uh, actually test your code directly on, on satellite hardware and start testing and integrating your, your code much before you would be able to uh, uh, otherwise. Uh, as you can see here behind me, actually, is one of our stacks that we have in our in our uh, in our Hopper cloud. Uh, we've got uh, most of the major manufacturers um, signed up to to be in this uh, interface, and then our long term vision is to do that exact same thing uh, on an actual spacecraft, where where satellite companies can start writing their flight software sooner. Um, the other thing that is a big um, problem in, in this industry around software is that. Satellite operations and uh, what we call con ops or sat ops um, is usually not really figured out until later after 
uh, after the hardware and stuff has been provided to the launch. And so what we do is we provide our mission operations software, which is a cloud-based uh, or on-premise based mission operations software. We provide that as part of our development tools. And what that means is you can actually start getting used to how your satellite will be operated in, in real life by doing it on the, on the desk while you're still developing the software. And you talked a lot about uh, different hardware architectures. We have a great question from the chat room from, I believe this is the Twitch chat room from Jarnies, which is, uh, what kind of hardware, uh, hardware architectures does CubeOS support, ARM x86, Spark, so forth and so on? Oh yeah, great question. So we actually, um, just to get a little more technical, we have we have actually two flavors of our OS. One is a real-time operating system, one is a Linux distribution. Uh, and we support the gamut of different hardware. So on our RTOS, we support uh, mostly like all the Cortex uh, ARM M chips the MSP430, uh, and a few other uh, lesser known uh, architectures on that one. And the Linux distribution, we mostly focus on the ARM uh, processor, but we've also had it ported to the x86. And uh, we are currently looking at PowerPC for some of the more uh, space grade uh, hardware that's on the larger satellite missions. It's funny you mentioned PowerPC. That's, it's, you, you, know, you, you think about those as, like, as an old school architecture. Uh, and I, what is the, I, I forget, but I want to say the fastest power PC that space rated is like 166 megahertz or something like that. That's, yeah, I think it may be slightly faster than that. Maybe it's a 200, but it's oh, you're, oh, you're in you're the right, right I'm ballpark. sorry, I was off. You're by in the whole, right ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's incredible <laughs> to me that that's, that's what it takes to kind of get into space uh, because you know space is hard and the radiation just rips through these modern day processors, something fierce. Uh, yeah. uh, also from the chat room, Neuropilot uh, asks, uh, does Cube work, uh, OS work on field programmable gate arrays, arrays FPGAs? Yeah, so uh, we are actually in the process of, port of doing our first port to an FPGA-based, uh, what's called a soft Cortex-M. I don't know how many technical details you want me to get into right now, but there's a there's a really well-known uh, CubeSat manufacturer called Clyde Space that develops an FPGA-based uh, Cortex-M, uh, soft Cortex-M with triple redundancy and all the fun bells and whistles, and that's one of the ones we are, are currently working on supporting. Uh, then uh, citizen, citizen Big Number, I like that name, uh, asks yep. uh, if you could give some concrete examples of what Cube OS will make easier. Yeah, yeah. So as I mentioned, we're really trying to save uh, the headaches of compressed dev time uh, in the early mission life cycle, but then also around the uh, usability amount of mission operations. Another thing that um, sort of a, maybe a, a consequence of the epiphany that no one's doing end-to-end -end software in this industry right now, um, if you go look at the available mission operations software for even just like a simple satellite mission, You'll find quite a few vendors that have really old, outdated hard uh, software. And if you compare the usability of that software to just something really simple like um, Google Cloud or Amazon Web Services, uh, it's really atrocious. Uh, it is really terrible. And um, while while not only is the user interface for those programs really terrible, and you have to like re seriously train to use that software, uh, on top of that, there's no integration whatsoever with whatever flight software you've written. So you've got to do manual configuration and do a ton of upfront work just to get it to work with whatever code you put on your satellite. And so uh, we wanted to eliminate a lot of those problems. And our uh, mission operations so software, which we call Major Tom, uh, <laughs> is a <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a uh, fully integrated uh, mission operations. Uh, platform that integrates with our onboard flight software, CubeOS. In other words, if you do any command and control definitions, telemetry definitions, all the stuff you typically do in a spacecraft uh, on, on the onboard flight software, it's fully integrated into the dashboards and command and control system in, in Major Tom, which means you have no configuration to do from one to the other. And then the other nice thing is that we are using like modern sort of UI UX from from like the rest of Silicon Valley style companies that have like a really strong focus on high usability, which means that uh, more people can use it, less need to, people need to be trained. You can actually have developers or even, God forbid, executives use this software. <laughs> um, and right, and you can have a mobile app to, to do a lot of these little things. Uh, and so that's, you know, again, we're just really hyper focused on making the entire experience more usable and more tightly integrated. All right, the nerd in me has to ask, is there any so part of your software now? Because you'll do the space to ground, ground to link kind of, not the communication itself, but like some of that control. So uh, is there a piece of code that does say ground control to Major Tom? Yeah, yeah, so well, obviously that's the, the, <laughs> the uh, yeah, the inspiration for the name of the product is Ground Control to Major Tom, the, the famous David Bowie song. Uh, we, do, we, we do plan to put an Easter egg to, to do something <laughs> along those lines in the near future. And we've had some funny versions. Uh, you know, we've, we've called the beta Lieutenant Dan a few times, I think, too. So, yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, 
so as I understand it right now, if I want to use CubeOS and I want to integrate it in my, uh, my uh, hardware platform, uh, I, st I still do have to do some development there. I have to be a C developer, uh, which there are a lot of C developers, but I am not a C developer, and I don't think, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of the regular space nerds watching the show, not C developers. That's correct, right? You have to be a C developer? Yes, right now. That's true. Okay. Yep. So uh, are there any plans to make it so that I can just buy a, a commercial off-the-shelf CubeSat and then grab a future version of CubeOS and just drop it on there. And I don't have to do any sort of development. It's just a bunch of checkboxes. Like someone like me, I can be like, OK, I've got these modules installed. I want to be able to see these things. Call home at this address, ready to go. Yeah, so the answer to your question is yes. In fact, I can do you one better. So um, if you remember the 90s, you probably remember that most uh, when you bought a PC, it came with Windows. Uh, in fact, it's pretty much still the case today. Um, Microsoft had this brilliant idea of like let the OEMs distribute our operating system for us, um, and it, it was a brilliantly effective strategy. And so um, I'm just taking a, a kind of a big page from that strategy book, and we're doing the exact same thing in the CubeSat space right now. In fact, we've got a number of different CubeSat manufacturers distributing our operating system uh, preloaded uh, on board the hardware. And so, in fact, when you buy this bus behind me uh, or another one that's made by a company called Isis, uh, they will literally ship the, our software on the hardware pre-configured, pre-installed for you. So there is no there is no setup or, or installation uh, procedure. You just use our SDK to write your custom payload code and, and you're done. So you're trying to kind of almost become the Windows of the CubeSat world. Uh, I, I don't like Windows, but you're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, uh, Moving that a step further, uh, you know, you've got the software on your device, but you still need to be able to control it, right? You still need your ground control. Um, Mac in Space asks, will you have satellite control from your mobile device? Uh, yeah, that is, well, so yes is the, the eventual plan. How we get there is the, is the major question there. Uh, we, the technology is not hard to make that happen. Uh, in fact, we, we do it already uh, in-house, like for our own in, inbound testing. The issue there is more around like what kinds of uh, regulations re exist around who controls a satellite and where and when. And so what we're trying to, we're trying to tiptoe into remote control uh, of a of a ground station that's not on premise with with the person controlling it uh, so you know we're we have some some things we're doing around uh, profiling the users who are actually going through that interface because you do have to you do have to profile where the where the people are coming from and the ground stations themselves when you're getting um, licensing from the FCC and other and other regulatory bodies for these things so um, we're again, all it really is is us trying to be careful with the regulations because we're an early stage company uh, but yeah the the tech technical feasibility of that makes it relatively straightforward and we will eventually have that in, as a major piece of our platform. The other interesting thing is you mentioned the ground stations, right? It's not like you can just use your phone and point it at your satellite and say, okay, send this right, command, right? right? You, have, you have to have that communications link between. I, I, it's interesting with all these different uh, startup companies, right? We've got some of the communications ground systems. We've got you as an operating system. Then we've got uh, the hardware platform. So we're starting to see some cohesion in all the elements necessary to actually create this um, next generation really easy to get um, cube set that anyone could buy and fly. It's going to be uh, pretty awesome. I think we're still a year or two away from that, but it's going to be pretty cool when you just you know swipe your credit card and have a fully working satellite platform ready to go. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's already pretty straightforward. There's a really cool website called uh, CubesatShop.com. You can literally buy a whole CubeSat bus like with a credit card through the website if you want to. I mean, it's you know it's a hundred grand or something, but if you've got that in your credit card, you can do that. Um, <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, but you're not wrong. I mean, we're we're getting it's getting cheaper, it's getting quicker, it's getting faster, and that's that's what all of us are trying to do right now. It's just sort of like that next wave of iterative, quick, like low cost development. That's what we want to see. That's where that's how innovation begins. The chat room is extremely interested in security. I'm going to just rattle off a, a bunch <laughs> of security questions all in a row, so we can kind of do it all in one section. Uh, you know, Space Mike asks, <laughs> how hard and easy is it to uh, hack a CubeSat? Um, uh, Lur asks, what built-in security hardening is in Q uh, CubeOS and the SDK? Um, yep. And then Rebel Ace Fan, is the software as scrutinized uh, as with airplane software, uh, things like, uh, and then uh, Johnny Boy, how is communication security managed on CubeOS? So uh, can you talk to, oh. like, you know, yeah, a lot of security questions. So, so talk to security a little bit from the OS and then maybe the comm link kind of side of it. Um, obviously, you don't do the, the link itself, but you know, are you doing encryption right. on board to send through that link, things like that? 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, just like any like major open source project, like we obviously try to take security very seriously. Um, we're also an early stage. We're also an early stage project. I'll just mention that right off the bat. Uh, but that being said, uh, so we do take security very seriously. Um, we are actually working directly with um, JPL right now to try and get our um, our not just our OS but all of our flight middleware and everything um, sort of checkmarked for their um, cyber secure. Um, uh, what they call their it's like their new. Um, uh, check off like their new I forget the the exact word they use now but the uh, verification process for their new security and so uh, they are defining what that means and we're kind of like going through that process with them right now but uh, essentially they're using all of the same cybersecurity protocols that are required for DoD software is what I understand uh, which is what's used on all the major DoD satellites um, and so yeah that's it's gonna take us some time to get up to snuff for all of those um, check marks I have no doubt uh, but uh, we, we are taking it very seriously, and our long-term strategy is to be as secure as possible, especially as we get into more government customers. With regards to, like, how CubeSats do security, um, you know, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be trying to be as frank as possible. Most of the CubeSat people I see doing projects right now, um, it's not that they're not worried about security. It's that, like, it's only going to be up there for 12 months, so they don't care anyway. Like, it's most of them are doing early technology demonstration, trying to prove something, and if they can just prove that, they're not looking to, it's not the old sort of, it's going to be up there for 20 years. And if I lose it, my entire business goes bankrupt. It's more like, oh, it's a throwaway device anyway, because it's a building, it's like a stepping stone for, for my project. And so you have to kind of have a different mindset about some of these earlier stage small spacecraft because they're not intended to be around forever or intended to be a giant expenditure for a company. You're also not going to have a constant uplink to these things, right? You have to have ground station right. control of that. So there's a lot... I mean, it's not necessarily security through obscurity, it's security through inability to connect to the thing. That's right. Uh, but moving forward, you know, I, I can see a time, right now most CubeSats are in low Earth orbit. Um, uh, I can see a time where CubeSats are sent further on as we figure out some of this next generation propulsion where they're going to planetary uh, bodies that are not Earth. Uh, so security may become a bigger concern. So you are working on that, or at least that is something that people are thinking of at least. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And you're absolutely right. I mean, we know a few of these guys that are looking at uh, both Mars and the Moon uh, as, CubeSat, as CubeSat developers. And so like the question of how you get the level of security a bigger satellite does when you've got literally like, you know, a, a couple orders of magnitude less power budget is a, is a real serious problem. Uh, and it's not just on the software side. It's also on like what can you do from a processing power standpoint. Uh, there's just so much, um, so many more constraints there. Uh, Rebel Ace Friesland asks, how does CubeOS compare to something like the Mars rover operating system? That's a great question. Uh, actually, I don't know a ton about the Mars rover operating system, to be perfectly honest with you. But I, I do know a lot about what NASA has done in the past with uh, some of their satellite um, onboard flight software. There's a really um, interesting project run out of Goddard called uh, Core Flight Executive, Core Flight Software Suite. And uh, some, of the, some of the stuff they've done there is a little bit more um, kind of old space, open source type stuff. But um, you know, you can you can kind of compare and contrast what we've done to Core Flight Executive pretty directly. Um, it's a lot of sort of uh, middleware, uh, message bus bus passing, telemetry definitions, command and control, um, you know, subsystem communications, ground system communications. It's a, it's, a, it's functionality along those lines, uh, where it, it's kind of the the bread and butter of what a satellite subsystem does or a satellite in of itself does. What's the most awesome moment you've had thus far, right? I mean, you're working on this software. Is, it, is there a moment where you're like, oh, this is really cool? <laughs> yeah, there's been quite a few. Actually, so personal career-wise, I can't. it's hard for me to top so far. Um, when I was at NanoSatisfy, so I, I forgot to mention earlier, NanoSatisfy eventually pivoted and are now called Spire. And so they've, they're more of a data sort of focused uh, satellite company now. But in those early days, you know, um, there was this picture um, of me holding a CubeSat um, and it was like put on I think The Verge or something. And it was just like me with like a pair, pair of blue gloves holding a one new CubeSat in front of me. It was a cool picture or whatever. But a few months after that picture was taken, um, for whatever reason, because ours was a ISS launch, um, I guess they decided to take high-res images when it was being deployed from the robotic arm of the ISS. And so they have, there's about half a dozen of these super high-res photos of that satellite, and you, there's no mistaking it. It's the same satellite I'm holding in my hands, being the launch from, and here's the robotic arm of the ISS coming down from the angle, and then here's like the, you know, the Earth, and, you know, against back relief. 
And I don't know, some, something about like that visceral, like I held that in my hands and a few months later, there it is in high definition in space. And um, I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to top that one. I, I can get a bigger satellite with the same thing, but as a personal career moment, it was a pretty high. <laughs> How about the flip side of that coin? How about like the most the most time-consuming, agonizing thing? You're like, oh, why won't this go? Or do you have one of those moments where you're, you're just you're trying to make something happen and it's just not going? Oh, I've got more more than my fair share, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> let's see. Well, which one do I focus on? Is really the big question there. Uh, yeah. So uh, late 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 into the software, um, it was a software integration for a satellite I was working on. Uh, we had run into a problem where the SD card, which was where we were storing most of our like large files. Oh, you found the photo. Awesome. Uh, yeah. So one of the S one of the um, one of the SD cards that we were storing using for all of our, our most of our photo and other data file storage. Uh, it turned out that there was resonance on the SPI line for that thing with uh, the radio that we were using. So what that basically meant was that anytime we used the radio, the SD card would go corrupt. And essentially it was a non-starter because that meant if we were trying to transfer a file down, uh, which means you're using the radio, um, the SD card, which you're trying to read the file from, would, would go kaput. So we had to figure out another way to to get stuff off the SD card into another temporary storage so that we could downlink it and not... not um, compromised SD card. So it's a technical thing, but basically I had to do this in under 12 hours before we had enough for launch. Oh, wow. And uh, we, uh, we, me and uh, another engineer spent um, an entire night overnight coding a system that we um, lovingly called Dennis Hopper um, because it was a Hopper system, but we, we really liked the actor Dennis Hopper who had like just died when we were writing this software. And so we, we created this system and it worked perfect. I can't, I can't still can't believe to this day that it worked perfectly, but it was one of those things where we, it took us like a month to figure out what the problem was and it, we had 12 hours to fix it and, and we fixed it and we were able to get a functional spacecraft out of it, uh, at the last minute. And it, it's still one of my most, um, sort of like, heroing and we, we solved the, the, the problem, but it, it was like at great cost. <laughs> so very important question. You're up all night. Is it Red Bull or coffee? Oh God. Uh, yeah, it was not either actually. It was, let's see, what were we drinking? Oh, oh, it was, it was definitely Coke Zero. I'm a big Coke Zero fan. Ah. <laughs> all right. Um, uh, I think this will kind of lead us well into uh, kind of closing out the interview and then going to our regular questions. Uh, uh, Dariachi, uh, <laughs> which is I have a they put a pronunciation guide in here for me. That's that's fantastic. Um, asks how expensive is it to get a license for CubeOS? Uh, they want to put it in a VM, a virtual machine, and experiment. So, like, we've got a bunch of oh, programmers. Go. You know, how, how do they get it? Guys, what, yeah, guys, it's on GitHub. Just go get it right now. It's on GitHub. GitHub.com/slash Cubos Tech. I'm not going to charge you a license. It's open source software. Yeah, which brings up a good point, right? So it's <laughs> it's open source. It's free. You can you can use it yeah. uh, under whatever license you've got there. So, what's your business model? How do you make money? Yeah, yeah. So this is another area that I came from uh, in my before I joined the space industry. So most of my career has been in uh, commercial open source. So uh, what that basically means is like making money off of free software. And uh, most people that kind of blows their mind. Uh, but actually, it's like pretty straightforward. Uh, we make all our money on uh, actually supporting the companies using our software. We we can do everything from uh, go on site, do train your train your team. We can uh, write custom hardware ports of the code. We can write custom modules. Uh, we can add to the product things that you need. Uh, we do a lot of uh, a lot of sort of. Uh, what we call service level agreements, where we actually will be a guaranteed response uh, to your team either during operations or development of your mission. So if things go wrong or if you need like a software update, we, we provide those on demand. And then also uh, Major Tom is another major component of that. So that's a cloud-based uh, subscription where that fully integrates with everything uh, as long as you're using CubeOS um, on your satellite. So that's a, that's a direct line of sort of revenue for us is uh, monetizing sort of the ground station infrastructure side. All right. Uh, where can people get more information on CubeOS, CubeOS, oh, oh, excuse me, CubeOS, CubeOS, and uh, everything you guys are working on? Uh, CubeOS.com. That's K-U-B-O-S.com. And uh, our Twitter account is CubeOSTech, K-U-B-O-S-T-E-C-H. All right. Now, main questions. No right or wrong answers. We ask all of our guests these questions. All right. Sure. First one up. Moon or Mars first? Oh, man. That is a contentious one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you're stuck uh, with your answer. You're never allowed to change it. <laughs> I, you know, uh, the dreamer in me says Mars and the pragmatist says Moon. All right. That's fair. Yep. yep. Although cheating, 
cheating slightly, but I, I think okay. So fair. So I I think Moon has to be first. I think probably. Oh wait, wait. Why does it have to be first? I just think it's a lot more practical to and cheaper, uh, and I don't I don't think that we're going to find much success uh, or like a, a a sustainable Mars colony until we f figure out how the hell that's going to work in a more in a much more friendly environment. Would you go? I um, when my kids are graduated from high school, maybe in adults. Yes, <laughs> I want to be with them until then. Would you bring them with you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, probably not. When do you think humans will first land on Mars? Um, at least 20 years from now. When do you think humans will set foot on the moon again? 10 years from now. My favorite question, mm -hmm. why space? Um, maybe I can turn it around on you, why not space? Interesting. <laughs> I, mean, right. I mean, I mean, the entire the entire human history is predicated on, uh, you know, expanding our civilization to the furthest corners of this planet. Why doesn't that extend to space? To me, it just seems like the obvious next step. All right. Awesome. Yep. Uh, Marshall, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday. Uh, it's incredible. Yeah. It's awesome that it's open source uh, and it's really yeah. fun to watch the uh, small sat market. Uh, really starting to grow right in front of our eyes. Um, you know, even a few years ago, I kind of looked at it and like, mm, that's not going to be a thing. And now I'm absolutely convinced that this is the future of us uh, getting out in space. This is going to be a big, huge market coming up really shortly here. It's, it's incredible to watch unfold. Well, thank you so much. And I, I fully agree with everything you just said. It's been incredible to be just a part of it and, and grow with it as it goes. So, All right. Thank you so much. We're going to take a quick break. Yep. And when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. and we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with comments from last week's show, shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are Escape Velocity patrons. We've also got our Orbital patrons. And a Special thank you to our suborbital patrons. These are people who have contributed $2.50 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, and apparently, uh, did you take a poll in there, or did they just mention it because of my name banner? The, uh, oh, what did your beard, name banner say? My name banner said something along the lines of uh, trying to grow a beard failing. Oh, that's oh, okay. it. I, it was odd. It was like as soon as you came on, everyone's like, oh, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and I was that's like, why. I don't that's know, why. Because yeah. the name banners, for those of you, you know, not viewing at home, uh, if you're in studio, the name banners don't pop up in real life. So They, they do. You just for, can't read it. Like, wow. they're, they're right there. Right? That's, see? Here it is. No, no. You just what can't we read see it. is I, it's, it's backwards, so we just. Oh, it's backwards for you. 
Not for us. Yeah. Yeah, because your screen gets flipped because of sky. All right, anyhow. Uh, so yeah, hilarious. And then uh, my favorite, I think my favorite was, I saw somewhere in the comment uh, room, someone said, uh, yeah, but Marshall has a real beard. <laughs> and yeah. he does. He does. And he does. <laughs> and looks fabulous. Actually, I'm curious. I'm, I'm trying, but I'm failing. I'm curious to know what you guys think. All right. Uh, Capcom, first comment. <laughs> uh, for those of you who watched last week's show, uh, where our special guest, our special guest, our guest, not that he wasn't special, uh, was Esteban Guzman talking about art in space and, <laughs> and you know, where they intersect. Uh, first comment comes off of YouTube from R Instro. Or Rinstro? R. And, yep, we're just going to go with that. Uh, once upon a time, quote unquote, regular people didn't go on ocean going sailing ships for the same reasons that they don't go on spacecraft now. The systems of the craft are complex and not reliably autonomous. Auto yeah, uh, every hand is needed to operate or monitor the ship. Space on board is at a premium and there's no established destinations which require spacecraft to get there and so on ad nauseum. Basically saying, you know, that, you know, every person on the ship serves a purpose. Yep, it does today, yes. right? And then uh, he, he actually did go on, he or she, they went on to say, uh, I agree with Space Mike's, once we get space forts, in quotes, and so on, uh, then a demand will go uh, way up for families to get them to show up and so forth. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense, right? You, yeah. You're, you're saying, all, all you know. All non-essential personnel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, th I think that's your point, though, right? Is that right now personnel are essential. We need something like a space fort where you don't need essential personnel, and then we'll be able to bring up families. And that's when we'll have a real colonization of space. Is that a fair assumption? That's yeah, and, and uh, just like our intro was saying with the whole uh, ship analogy, I mean, when once uh, transatlantic uh, uh, ships were, were taking place from Europe to the Americas, I mean, it was a while before regular people started. I mean, you could you could say that the first colonies, you know, were pretty brave people, but even those people were very involved in the entire process, and you couldn't exactly say that those first colonists um, were non-essential persons because they all had had jobs to do. So yeah, just just like we're both saying here, until things things like that happen where things are a little bit more established then all the non-essential personnel can start showing up so but we're getting closer to that right i mean we're getting closer to the point where i hope so yeah yeah i mean but you look at like a spaceship 2 sort of flight i mean they're about what 6 months away and uh, you, you, there, those will be non-essential personnel and real you know that's just up and down but you, then you take that and you extend it maybe a little bit further you can see where that extends to a bigelow module well, you know, they're not going to be essential personnel. And now you've got kind of this, um, it's not inflatable, it's expandable, it's expandable space habitat. Um, yeah, no, don't call it inflatable, expandable. I, 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 you know, you can pretty clearly see a path here. It's just that it, we're not there yet. Is that fair? Everyone yeah. agree? All right. Yeah, we're not at that stage yet. All right, next up, Capcom. Uh, also off of YouTube from Samuel Price. Because I can, I can count and I can multiply, and for fun, I decided to figure out your minimum donations, and it comes to a paltry $61,360 per year. You guys must really love making this program. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, actually, uh, we do tend to cover, uh, you know, numbers a little bit more in our Patreon hangouts and uh, on Patreon, like where, the, where your funds are going. Because uh, over 100% of the patron funds go to something. I, I actually did, I don't mind having this in the show, and I... It, it, I'll give you, you know, some basic numbers of, uh, that number is actually pretty close. Um, it's not quite right because it makes a few assumptions. You, know, you don't have access to the full data set. So it's closer to 60,000 per year. Um, but you, know, you, you look at like this space is uh, 2,000 per month. So you know, that adds up very quickly. Uh, then we, we, pay, we pay people to actually work on the show. That's another $1,500 per month. And we've got bandwidth at $500 per month. We've got hosting at $1,000 per month. And you'll notice if you start running those numbers, I've already gone up to $60,000, uh, not quite $60,000, because uh, I'm missing our Adobe Creative Cloud licenses, which are another $500 per month. I believe that brings us up to $60,000. I don't actually have my numbers in front of me here. And that doesn't include anything like the cameras, the lights, the sets, or anything else like that. So uh, we actually do like the show because we pay to be here. <laughs> in addition to all the Patreon funds, it actually costs us money to run the show. Now that won't be like that all, all the time. We're actually very, we're getting very close to break even at this point, which is a really great place to be because we've been doing this for 10 years and you know our costs have increased. 
but the show, I think, has increased. I would say the show quality has increased. Like, the awesomeness of the show has gone up. But if you're a patron subscriber, you'd like to know where your funds go, feel free to ask me at any time. I'm more than happy to let you know where everything's going. Some things are just, like, crazy purchases by me, like spending $5,000 on a graphic for a planet behind us, then going, mm, I don't like it, let's do it again, and spending another $5,000 on a different graphic it behind us. It wasn't just because you didn't like it. <laughs> it was falling. Yeah, it was falling, to be fair. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the show, this show does cost a lot. Uh, it doesn't bring in a whole lot. That's also not our only revenue source. There are ads, but, you know, the, the, we get very little money from that. Uh, and there are other, other things. One thing I did want to mention is I don't like calling Patreon donations. You do get something in return. You're not, you're not donating to the show. You're, we're trying to give you something back. So you give to the show. Hopefully you get something from the show in the show itself. Uh, and then if you contribute to the show, we're going to do our best to make that worth your while it, as, as best we can. So uh, your name in the show as a thank you, uh, giving you access to content a little bit earlier than everyone else, uh, giving you access to additional rooms, like depending upon, like giving you access to information and rooms and, and things like that. So you are getting something in return. So it's in, in, my, in my mind, I don't like calling Patreon a donation-based system. Uh, you are supporting the show, uh, and we absolutely appreciate it. And without your support, uh, this show would not be what it is today. We'd yeah. still be doing it because we did it before without Patreon. The show will still happen no matter what. We've been in basements. We've been at the back of coffee shops. Uh, we, we've been in uh, dining rooms and living rooms. Uh, yeah, I, we would. This was actually going to be in our garage for a while. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, no, we we, we would still be doing this anyway, <laughs> yeah. as long as somebody out there cared for sure. But uh, every, because every dollar, every penny you give towards the show is something that we can then put towards the show to make it better. And so we do appreciate every single penny because it helps us do more things. It helps us be more awesome. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to get these really awesome lights or be on Station 204. We wouldn't have Station 204 yeah. if it wasn't uh, for you guys. Uh, and I, we absolutely appreciate it. From the bottom of our hearts, we absolutely appreciate it. And, um, you know, there are things I can do to bring those costs down if we need to, uh, but it will have a negative impact on the show. So instead, I choose, you know, you're contributing to the show. So do we. We'll continue to contribute to the show as well, not just in time, but in money also. So there you go. Hopefully, our, our mission is not to make money. Our mission is to spread the word about space. Yeah. We don't make money on this show. That's correct. What your your contributions allow us to be awesome at making space interesting for everybody else. Yep. You got it. You got it. Absolutely. That's so it. we're gonna as we get more Patreon funds, we're going to put that back into the show and do more cool things. Um, you, you can see some of the rewards, but one of the things I want to do is bring back launch coverage. Um, I'd like to expand this into other shows like science. I think that's going to be really cool. And then use those other shows, science, cities, technology, and whatnot, to funnel people back into space. I think that's a really good, great way to great. What are you laughing at? Space Kyle says space evangelism. And then it goes on to say, have you heard the good word about space today? <laughs> <laughs> that is kind of what that, that was. That's what done it. I felt a little a bit. Little bit uh, a little was, bit. That yeah. was good. All right. All right. Anyhow. Fun. Enough there. Uh, so, uh, and, and you know, uh, OptiQuest Twenty One says, "I think Dutta needs a camera." We know. He ha well, he kind of. We're has working a on it. Well, if we had more Patreon funds, maybe. We hey, could he has a There's microphone. Dutta. That was half the battle. There, there's the back of Dutta. There you all go. Right. <laughs> all, right. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> next. Well, comment. that was awkward. <laughs> You've already been able to read the next comment for a moment. All right. All right. Sorry. Next comment. Threw me off, man. Right, <laughs> uh, but just wait. Hang on. One yeah, last thing to ahead. Samuel's point. To Samuel's point, we absolutely do love making the show. Uh, so I, yeah. I don't. No, it's hard to read uh, intent on the internet without any sort of, like, you can't infer inf inflection. So I don't know if you were being serious or sarcastic, um, but I'm going to take it as, you know, being serious. Because well, right, because to some people, $61,000 is a lot of money. And to, and other to others, people, it's, it's not. It's, it's, it's not, a drop so in the bucket. So it, I, I have no I have no inference there. But still, uh, that But was yes, the, uh, we absolutely do, because we do lose money on it. We absolutely love making the show and joining you week after week to do this. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the highlight of my week. Yeah, mine too. So, I think yeah. it's, I think it's great. All right, next up. I'm sorry, next up. That's okay. Next comment comes off of our very own website, tmro.tv. What? You can what? comment there? I, no one ever does. <laughs> uh, but, but John Eric Thompson did. So John says, I strongly agree with Estevan Guzman on going to the moon before going on to Mars. There are so many, many things that need and should be tested out on our closest object first before continuing on to Mars. I think we've determined that, I think, I don't want to put words in my mouth, but moon or Mars first, Mike? 
Moon first. Okay, well, Jared. We got to do both, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I no, agree. first, first. You got to pick one first, right? You're not, you're not going to concurrently have humans stepping foot on both celestial bodies at the exact moment in time. I don't right? see why not. If, <laughs> yeah. if we can get a rocket to launch from two different space Co coasts and coordinating, then... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that, <laughs> like, that's a weird thing I to coordinate. I kind of feel like maybe we could figure that part so out. So I'll say that everyone at tomorrow <laughs> likely thinks we should do both. That's yeah, not in yeah, question. Think, Obviously, Moon yes, and Mars. Yes. The question is which one's first. So you're Moon first. Question, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, okay, yes, moon first. Yes, moon first. At least if not our moon, then at least Phobos first. Okay, a moon first. All right, yep, moon or Mars. Yeah, um, I always first. say space first. Uh, but if, What does that mean? That means that space brings out the best in us and forces us to address the technological issues that come with that, and it benefits everybody from that. So it's not necessarily about the destination to me. It's the ability to actually get there. Okay. is what matters to me. The ability to um, get there. So that's why I say space first. Um, but if I have to be put into a corner somewhere yeah, you in a corner. and put the gloves on, uh, moon first. Moon first. Uh, Dada, moon or Mars first? Moon. Moon first. Carrie Ann? Uh, yeah, without the exclusivity, right? I don't want to say moon first and then like another 27 generations, it's Mars. Sure. Right? You know, so... Work both concurrently, but right, you know, right, 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 right. Perfect world situation, blah blah blah. Do moon first, learn some stuff, get that done, and then without it going past a decade more, you're on Mars. Yeah, I'm actually with everyone else, so I think the entire crew here is moon first. Yeah, um, and I, I think moon first at, because of your point. Rob I, Rancher is is ye yelling. Yeah, for sure, both, absolutely, both, 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 both. Don't We're get any both. of us wrong. Uh, and it cannot be, it cannot be moon. Uh, at the expense of Mars, either, right? Mm -hmm. Right. It, it, we should be go working. to the moon for the Mars program. We, in use, order to we get go to the to moon Mars. in order to get to Mars, and, and in order to go beyond that, yeah. we don't stop at Mars. We yeah. keep going. We yeah. keep exploring. That's what mm -hmm. we do. Uh, uh, you could. I used to be Mars first. You convinced me actually, Moon first, because of the ability to look up at it and be inspired and go. There are people there, and I think there's a very powerful message for a, a lot of people who maybe aren't space geeks to be able to look at the Moon and uh, in something in, a, in their brain. I think might switch on when they realize that there are humans living on the Moon. Yeah, uh, I think I, that's going to be pretty. Pr my, uh, that's going to be an incredible moment for humanity. My analogy, for those of you who haven't heard it before, uh, in general, is that we're originally from Minnesota. We now live in California. It doesn't matter the top, the highest thing that I climb in California. Not that I can climb very high, but assume for a second, uh, I can't see my family in Minnesota. But at any given point in time, assuming it's not a cloudy night, blah blah blah, uh, if I was living on the moon, I could go outside and I could see Earth, and they could walk outside in Minnesota and look up and see the moon. Essentially, we'd be able to see each other, right? And and that's that connection. And it's just it's just not something you get inherently uh, from Mars on Mars. And I, I think that's that's a huge motivator just in general. And it, it keeps that connection going as well. Uh, I'm going to push back a little bit on Jared's comment of you know you know just space. Well, that's what we had with the shuttle, and we were stuck in low Earth orbit for 30 years. Uh, we always have to be stretching further. So mm -hmm. I'm okay with going to just space so long as the intention is that, okay, moon next and then Mars next. There always needs to be something bigger and better and beyond. And if we're just like, well, you know, just space, as long as we're in space, I think then we get locked into just space. And we've had that for 30 years now. And uh, I, I think that's actually a bad thing. I think we need to be, we need to always be looking for the next great thing that we can do. I think, I think I have a better analogy for you. Yeah, sure. go ahead. The, we need to go to the moon, and that is our space shuttle approach and landing test. And then we need to go to Mars, and that's STS-1 and beyond. I see what you're yeah. saying. Good way to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I could buy that. All right, cool. Yeah. So there cool. you go. That's, uh, that's where we're at with that. All right, uh, that is our show this week. Uh, we've got Jim Cantrell, CEO of Vector Space Systems, coming on next week. That's going to be an interesting show. Um, uh, yeah, because they just flew a rocket. They just flew a rocket. So, uh, yeah. It, it's, so, good timing. We're, we're just talking about CubeSat <laughs> operating systems and like CubeSat develop, and now we've got a CubeSat rocket coming on the show. It's all coming together. It's all coming together. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> uh, that's, coming up, uh, yeah, uh, that's coming up next week. Uh, for those of you watching live or if you're a, at the um, suborbital or above level, After Dark is up next. And we also wanted to thank all of our ground support patrons. These are people who've contributed between one penny and two dollars and 49 cents for helping to make this show go week after week. All right, I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. We'll see you next week. <laughs>